Good morning. What if Google were managed like a fast food company? When you called them, would they answer, thank you for calling Google, home of the original search engine. Would you like to try instant search today? Ridiculous. This doesn't match the customer need. Our techniques must match our systems. Our systems must have clear objectives. And we must do something that works, something that leverages our objectives. I'm Larry Malik, an engineering professor from Western Michigan University. I use techniques from engineering and social sciences to solve complex systems problems because systems thinking helps us make better decisions. In the remake of the movie Arthur, released in 2011, the Arthur character played by Russell Brand noticed an ad for a systems integration professional to which he remarks, like anyone would approach that as an amateur. Who does that in their spare time? Who spends their weekends integrating systems? Well, people who want to energize Earth spend their time integrating systems. Josie King was a normal one and a half year old when she climbed into the bathtub one day. The bathtub was too hot. She suffered first and second degree burns. She was taken to Johns Hopkins University Hospital for treatment. Things were looking good. Her recovery was quick. Her burns were looking healing beautifully. She'd be ready for discharge in just a few days. Her mother was with her throughout this entire episode. The nurse told her mother, don't give her anything to drink. Her vitals are just fine. She's normal. Later that day, her mother looked at her and said, you do not look normal. Push the nurse call button. The nurse came down. One thing led to another. Despite a no narcotics order, Josie was given a shot of methadone. She went into cardiac arrest. Two days later, in the pediatric ICU, she died. Every year, 100,000 people in the United States die because of medical error, because of a lack of integrated systems and a lack of leverage, of system leverage in those systems. Josie's King's story, as told by her mother, inspired many medical professionals to sign on to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's 100,000 Lives campaign to save 100,000 lives lost to medical error. Don Berwick, the CEO at the time and now in charge of Medicare in our U.S. system, has been quoted as saying he is safer climbing Mount Everest than he is in a U.S. emergency room. Imagine that. IHI focused on six simple steps, having tremendous leverage to save lives. For example, when a patient presents with an apparent heart attack in the ER, current guidelines call for aspirin to be given upon arrival. Aspirin has been shown to reduce the severity of heart attack and to prevent future heart attacks. That's evidence-based medicine. We know some relatively simple actions that can be taken to make a big difference in a patient's care. Once again, we can leverage our system objectives. IHI's campaign went on to save over 122,000 lives. They are now on a 5 million lives campaign. The decisions we make, as many have said here already today, have consequences down the road, whether they deal with high-tech strategies or life-and-death situations. When we understand how to use tools from system analysis, we can create great change and energize this earth. Let's take another look at another decision being made around the country and around the world. Is driving an electric car a green thing to do? This is a Nissan LEAF parked at a charging station at Western Michigan University's engineering campus. The car is quiet, it has zero emissions, and it doesn't burn fossil fuels. Is it green? As we expand our system boundaries from the car to the community to Earth, we get a different view. As an all-electric car, the Nissan LEAF does not use any gasoline, diesel, or other fossil fuels. You plug it in to charge it, it generates energy upon braking, and its range is up to 100 miles. But where does the electricity come from? What is the system cost of an electric car? When we make decisions from a limited context, electric cars are green, we disregard the larger system implications. In fact, trying to be green with electric cars leads to burning more coal in somebody else's town, producing emissions, and risking lives in coal mines. Where does the electricity car, electric car's electricity come from? Now, the leaf you saw before 
That electricity actually came from a renewable source, a wind turbine on the WMU campus. But for most of us in this country, almost two-thirds of our electricity needs come from burning fossil fuels, from coal and burning natural and other gas. So this car, generally speaking, is not zero emissions when viewed at a higher level. Where is the energy for that car stored? And onboard batteries. You know there's new firefighting guidelines for electric and hybrid cars? These guidelines have additional precautions because of the high-level hazardous materials content in those cars. How is that car produced? Generally, on traditional manufacturing and assembly lines, using the same techniques to produce other cars, producing its own set of emissions. So, is an electric car green? It may appear green, but as we expand the system boundary, we find different truths. It's not zero emissions. It has a lot of hazardous materials content. The system's view makes it look like conspicuous conservation. More on that in a few minutes. Systems thinking helps us make better decisions. If we are to energize Earth, we must spend our energy, fossil and human, better. We need to understand the system implications of our decisions and actions. There's a finite amount of fossil fuel energy on Earth. When it's gone, it's gone. Not long ago, author Thomas Friedman summed up the U.S. approach to energy in this manner. We borrow money from China to buy oil from countries that don't like us. So, we build hybrid cars, we build electric cars, we build high mileage cars. We put in bike racks, we add more buses, we print carbon usage on our airplane tickets. We turn energy use into a video game. We have lead kiosks, we have Prius dashboards. But we are still in our cars going down the road. Let's take the road to India. What are the computing needs of a farmer in India? Think about it. A farmer in rural India wants to sell his wheat at a fair market price. How does he do this? Intel has taken a systems approach called empathic design. Researchers from Intel went to India to identify the computing needs of that rural farmer. Imagine that. They found the farmer needed information on current market pricing for crops and a way to link with buyers at those prices. The farmer needed computer access. That led Intel to work with computer makers using its chip technology to design a public computer kiosk. Intel found out that the farmers needed a computer that worked in the harsh Indian environment, one that is robust against India's heat humidity, dust, and monsoons. Instead of an opportunistic market maker telling the farmer what price he's going to pay for the wheat, the farmer, empowered now, goes to the kiosk, accesses current information, makes a deal. Now he has more capital to plow into his farm, feed his family, and buy local goods. As a systems approach, empathic design observes users in their own habitats, asking different questions, identifying the rituals they engage in, and discovering unarticulated user needs. Things they can't tell you. These are the unknown unknowns. When Apple was designing the iPod, they didn't go to the customer and say, what do you need in terms of some, of some sort of digital music player? What are you looking for? No, no focus groups. Instead, Steve Jobs worked with his designer, Johnny Ive, to strip back, simplify, and beautify what is now the iPod. The idea was to design something the customer didn't know they needed. Jobs was known for his zen-like simplicity. He used it when he returned to Apple in 1997 to trim down that company to a handful of products, just like he learned at Pixar with their short list of blockbuster releases like Toy Story and Finding Nemo. Here is a green building. La Maestra is a safety net clinic located in the City Heights neighborhood of San Diego. When I visited La Maestra, I met with CEO Zara Marcellian and Lindy Webb. They showed me and my Center for Health Design colleagues their gleaming new facility, which was designed to lead standards. They showed me the lead kiosk in their lobby, the green materials to build the clinic, and talked about the construction practices they used. In the process, they said that green saved them money. I was like, what are you talking about? Green saved you money? They said, yes, uh, we were able to negotiate some very good discounts with our suppliers based on our nonprofit status. And I thought, well, 
not everyone can have a skilled negotiator like Zara on their staff to do this. How can other people do this? So I investigated green design, and I found significant evidence that in the building industry, that green can be cost effective. In fact, I ended up designing a web-based cost-benefit tool that allows clinic designers around the world to input design details for their clinic and compute the net costs or benefits of green design. You can find that tool on the Center for Health Design's website at healthdesign.org and look for the clinic site. In this case, decision-making in a limited context says green costs more. Don't do this, especially if you're building a safety net clinic. You're going to pay more. You're never going to get it back. Spend the money on patient care instead. When we expand that decision context out five or ten years, the green benefits easily outweigh the costs in almost any configuration. So it's true. You will pay more up front. But the evidence says you will save 30% on your energy costs. You'll use less water. You'll experience lower absenteeism. You'll have healthier employees. And people will like you because you're green. <laughs> this is documented evidence on green buildings. Why wouldn't you build green? Another system problem facing us today is having anthropology drive decisions, not ecology. What do I mean by this? The indigenous peoples in our organizations have made decisions this way for many years, anthropology. Many people want to be seen being green, anthropology. This is evident in our conspicuous conservation. That term comes from Stephen and Allison Sexton, who wrote an article on that topic. But a recent study, survey of Prius owners, asked them, what is one of the main reasons you bought your vehicle? 57% said, it makes a statement about me. <laughs> so the Prius, as you know, has a distinctive body shape. It says, I am green. Prius owners boast their high mileage numbers. In fact, I just was interested in check last night. There are mileage contests online for your Prius to see how high you can get it. Okay, again, the dashboard. So some Prius owners put the pedal to the metal, canceling out a lot of the energy conserving features. Interestingly enough, the Honda Civic Hybrid scores almost identically on the green metrics as the Prius, but the Prius outsells it like crazy. Why is that? When you drive down a road and you see a Prius, you know that's a hybrid. The hybrid Civic just looks like a Civic. So many wish to ensure their green cred is evidenced all over the place. That's why homeowners install, some homeowners install their solar panels facing the street instead of to the south or west for best exposure. <laughs> this behavior optimizes the perception of green, but sub-optimizes the outcome of energy capture, which is what it's all about, right? We need to move from this anthropology to ecology. So let's move to corn. I live in Michigan. We grow corn. I'm from Illinois. We grow a lot of corn. Corn is the basis of many diets, including our fossil fuel and our sugary addictions. It's found in gasoline as ethanol, found in many sweets and sodas, as high fructose corn syrup. Corn has become more than livestock feed and third world staple. You throw in uh, Midwest U.S. drought, crazy demand from China, and you see sharp price increases on what used to be a very sleepy commodity. Look at this, $2 a bushel in 2006. Now we're paying almost $8 a bushel for corn. The price quadrupled in a short six years. What is the system impact of that? I'll tell you. Kellogg's Corn Flakes, right, made right here in Michigan, goes up 26% when corn prices quadruple. However, if we look at corn soy blend, which forms a diet of a typical Kenyan, as supplied by the World Food Program, that's estimated to go up 150%. That's a big change to the Kenyan. Let's talk about a car, a cow, and a Kenyan. All consume corn, but for different reasons. A typical car using 10% ethanol will require 27 bushels of corn per year. A cow eats enough to require 143 bushels of corn per year, and a typical Kenyan's diet requires 46 bushels of corn per year. The car and the cow have relatively low price sensitivity. The owners will divert funds from other budgets, while a Kenyan family will have difficulty with the increase in corn prices. In fact, the Kenyan balance sheet goes negative when corn prices go up. 
Most Kenyans are of the half of the world that lives on $2 a day. So here in the U.S., our high cost of labor buffers the price increase of underlying commodities such as corn. So we can take a hit, a quadrupling of corn, and it only goes up 26% as we notice it in our corn flakes. But we're putting more corn in our cars so we can drive more. We're putting corn in our food and soda so we can grow more. We're becoming obese while our neighbors in Kenya struggle for food security. They have tough choices, eat less corn or find something else to eat. We can contribute more money to charity to try to support food relief in Kenya, but ultimately it does not make for a sustainable system. We're merely subsidizing the cost of corn, but not changing our corn consumption. Again, we're optimizing a subsystem and suboptimizing the larger system. Systems thinking helps us make better decisions. The U.S. exports many items throughout the world, but perhaps our most influential export is our culture. People in countries around the world want our clothes, our homes, our jobs, our movies, our lifestyle. When people understand the system's implications of our decisions, it will only be a matter of time before a Kenyan child has the awareness to say, feed me.